What's up everybody, it's Skullman here, bringing you Skullman Reads once again. It's been forever since I've posted the last Skullman Reads, and I am very thrilled to be posting uh, a new Skullman Reads after so long. Um, so if you guys would be so kind as to like the reading that I'm doing right now to help support the series again, and um, yeah. Every like and every comment you guys basically make, it it definitely helps me out a lot. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, uh, on with the story. Today I'm going to be reading The Writer and Their Quill, and it's by Pink Mina Diane Pye. And um, it's supposedly a tragedy. So um, I am going to be reading all five chapters of this story. So if you guys want to listen to a specific chapter, every chapter is going to be in the description, so if you want to listen to a certain chapter, just go ahead and click on one of those links in the description, and it'll take you right to that chapter. So, yeah. But, anyway, the intro's done with. Let's get the story started, and let's reamp this fucking series. Here we go, everyone. Hope you enjoy. The alicorns are the most bizarre and unique of all the ponies in Equestria. We have wings like the Pegasi to allow incredible speed and maneuverability in the air. We have a horn like the unicorns, allowing us to summon and control the flow of magic around us. We also possess the phenomenal strength and a toughened resolve from the earth ponies. Yet even among all this, we have one ability which is as mysterious as the alicorns themselves. When an alicorn comes of age, the secret of life is revealed. It isn't as glorious as it sounds but its simplicity is terrifying. We are capable of seeing when mortals will perish. Blunt, isn't it? The curse of immortality once again rears its ugly head and forces away any shadow of uncertainty in our world. Is nothing scared in my eyes? That I can never tell. In my youth, I thought death to be a power beyond our reckoning, beyond our control. It would be forever shrouded in a fog, which was only lifted when it finally caught up to us. Even death held no bounds for me. I could see it around me, but never feel its icy fingers touch me in an everlasting embrace. I may seem ungrateful, for, or maybe even angry at the position I'm in. To a certain extent, this is the truth. I've lived for longer than some of the oldest cities in Equestria. I've watched boundaries of nations pushed and stretched, and yet I can't help but feel as if I shouldn't watch it all. This is getting heavy. I'm probably just writing in anger through my depression. Or maybe I'm just getting tired. After all these years, maybe things will catch up to me. This is a tale of how I learned of my place in this world. Of how I never stood near the top. And even when I got close, immortality cut off another pool of happiness for me. It's happening again. It's getting heavy. To any pony reading this, I have written this as a personal memoir, a lesson. This shall be stored in the Cancelot Library as a fable, a parable if you will. I shall make my lessons known to those who want to learn, so that never again will I feel in control, and so that this message is passed down. My name is Princess Celestia, and this is the story of how I became immortal. Today's the day. The day which I have been looking forward to all week. Today is the first day of my non-working week. No more politics, no more grand introductions, just plain, simple times ahead. My week has dragged on, but at the end, I know I've got nothing on my plate. Today and tomorrow are all for myself. I can do whatever I like and not be told otherwise. I'm rather excited. I've tried to contain a grin as I walked, but it was difficult. I wasn't normally this happy for a work-free weekend as I am free for most weekends for that matter. However, this one was special, and one certain pony made it special. Today was Twilight's Day. I could feel a small giddy rush of excitement quicken my pace as I thought of the fun we would have. In the east wing of my library, the librarian had encountered a previously unopened chest filled with old, unsorted, unread books. 
I was looking forward to the task for, of reading and sorting through their dusty pages. But there was one pony who, I knew, would enjoy perhaps even more than me. Yesterday I sent the invitation for spending the weekend with me, and the positive reply came back swiftly. She was due to arrive in one hour by train from Ponyville. Although I had no exact plans of we, what we were to do besides reading and sorting, but I knew she would have some idea of where she would like to spend some time. I skipped a step and turned into a longer corridor of my palace. I descended a short stack of stairs and continued down the corridor. She would leave tomorrow, just after midday. I hoped she would have enough time to have breakfast with me before she departed. The librarian appeared at the end of the corridor. He towed a small cart behind him, which was piled high with the ancient books for our reading event. I smiled at him as I passed. Good morning, princess, he said with much effort. His face was strained through the workload and his brow sprinkled with diamonds of perspiration. He seemed frail and older than I'd ever seen him. I quickly assessed his age. Thirty-five years left. Enough for twenty of useful service. I smiled. Good morning, Blue Page, I said in a tone more excited than welcoming. He quickly grinned back and gave a quick bow of his head before turning off again down the corridor. His corded pen clicked against the back of his leg as he walked. I turned in the corridor into a flight of stairs leading to the pal stores of the West Wing. As I reached the bottom, a shout came down the stairs from above. Celestia! called a familiar voice. I spun to face my sister. She leaned casually over the banister with a steaming mug levitating beside her. Good morning, Luna! I called up to her. Good morning, you! You raised the sun earlier than usual, sister, she said, taking a sip from her mug. I had no idea. I was up rather early, admittedly, I said. She smiled. She must have known why. Go greet her then, she said. She took another sip of her drink. Her train will arrive late. I didn't question how she knew this, but I could give credence to it. I turned and made my way out of the door. I could feel myself swaying gently if my excitement wasn't already apparent to the other ponies around me. I may have been rather concerned about the number of questioning glances sent my way. I caught a few stares and stray looks. It becomes easy to forget that I am a public figure. I glanced up at the clock and to the horizon. Twilight's train was due four minutes ago, and I already organized the day in a neat schedule, and this delay would account for a few changes, namely pushing all events back by maybe up to ten minutes. I didn't let it get to me. Today was Twilight's day. We could do whatever she wanted to regardless of my list. Silver-crested clouds rose from over the top of the mountains. I smiled. Shortly after, the train rumbled around the corner, and the silver trail of smoke left streaks climbing into the sky. It's about time, called a stallion's voice from the crowd of passengers. I made my way to the back of the platform to allow room for the passengers to step off. The train trundled in moments later, and many grumpy morning passengers climbed off. From among the sleepy yawns and slow-moving crowds, a familiar violet face caught my eye. Her wide smile stood out vibrantly in the dull crowd. She made her way through the crowd towards me. So, what do you want to do before we hit the books? I asked. The carriage hit a bump in the road as I finished. She turned from her window to face me. I'm not sure, she said. Her eyes hovered on me for a moment as she thought. We could go to Joe's. I haven't been there in months. If it's all right, princess. We may do whatever you wish. This is your day, Twilight. Call me Celestia when we're alone, I said. I couldn't have a friend addressing me fully in our studying together. She nodded and then smiled for a moment. Of course, Celestia, she said, although it seemed more forced than I liked. I'm sorry for my lateness, she said, blushing. I knew how much she liked being on time with all things. The train had a mechanical malfunction. We could have nearly crashed at one point after the engineer couldn't slow it down. Oh, I'll request it to be fixed tomorrow before your departure. Although, you are welcome to stay longer if you'd like, I said, fishing for a response. She shook her head. Applejack has requested for my assistance on the farm, and I already obliged to spend time with her, she said. Very well. The carriage trundled onward around another two blocks before I spoke up again. 
I was expecting her to make some conversation. Is there anything you'd like to do after we visit Joe's? I asked without looking at her. I'm not sure, she said, yawning. We could just start work after then. I gave her a questioning glance. Why do you want to retire so early? Your day is today, Twilight. She yawned again. I've been just feeling rather tired lately. I'm not even sure why I checked. It was a horrible thought to even consider, but out of habit I checked. I always checked when some pony says something like that. 26 hours. I thought I misread it. I took a second and third glance at it. 26 hours. I frowned and looked for an error. 26 hours. She continued to stare at me, obviously to my terror building inside. 26 hours. She was talking, but I couldn't hear her. I could only feel the gentle bump of the carriage, and I could only see the faded gray digits hovering like ghosts above her head. Twenty-six hours. My student, my friend, Twilight Sparkle, was destined to die soon. Only twenty-six hours. I can't sleep. How can I sleep? My friend is sitting a mirror or two away, sleeping away her final hours, and there's nothing I can do about it. Nothing. What use is this gift of immortality if I can only be a statue for those around me? I can speak to them, I can feel them, but I'm an alien among them. I see the world through my own window. Through my own window, the world is old, changing and so full of death. Those who I use to confide and have a long since passed, and their names and titles would fall on the ears of youth without recognition. I've talked to the dead at this age, and it seems like their memories are still so fresh in my mind. I let out a sigh, which I hoped she wouldn't hear. I leant over toward her on the edge of my chair. I peered over the top of the pile of books. She was asleep. The quill cupboard was over her shoulder, as her head lay deep into the dusty paged book. Her gentle breathing sounded so nice, I thought. I sat back into my chair and pressed my hooves on either side of my head. I can't even tell her. She will never know. I know she will die, and I'm still powerless to stop it. My thoughts are circling. I need options. Could I stop her death? If I keep her in my place, refuse her request to leave my safeguarding in these secure stone walls, could I be forgiven if I were change the course of a life? I don't know. We were told never to touch what we couldn't control, never to stare when we couldn't see, and never to rewrite what is already written. Is her death written? Or am I the writer? Surely I can control some aspects. What use is a power of seeing life if I am not to preserve it? A knock at the door drew my thoughts blank. I raised my head to check that twilight hasn't woken, and then back to the door. My sister leaned upon the door frame. A look of concern was badly contained in her face. She had the same signs when she was young, and she could never change her propensity. Emotion was a part of us, which she held more strongly than me. She gave a quick flick of her head outside. I knew what she wanted to talk about. I rose from my wooden stool and went outside. Before leaving, I glanced back toward Twilight, just to make sure she hadn't stirred, and then I left the room. I glanced down to the short corridor of my tower. A dim orange glow seeped out of the room beside me. A shadow moved across the light. I walked toward it and glanced in. The strong, sweet aroma of cocoa caught my attention first. Two cups were stationed upon a glass-topped table in the center beside two embroidered chairs. I looked up to the first chair where Luna sat with her eyes averted as she glanced around the book pile beside her. She looked back at me and smiled. Sit, she said quietly. She gave a gesture to the second embroidered chair. I smiled back faintly and went toward the chair picking up the cocoa as I went. 
As I sat, Luna also picked up her mug. She took a small sip and placed it back on the table. I counted the marshmallows in the top, and then took a drink also. Three marshmallows. One more than my usual amount. I figured you could use with one more, she said after I placed my drink down. I smiled. You know what I want to talk about. I sat back into my chair. I would love to believe there was an easier solution, I said as I retraced my thoughts from earlier. Could I prevent her from leaving tomorrow? I asked. I looked up to Luna's face, and it wasn't forgiving. No, she said. She crossed her hooves. You surely remember what we were told. Never rewrite what is written. I grounded my teeth. You surely don't believe the words of an ancient time are enough to stop me from saving my friend. It is not your life to save. So what, let her die? I say absent of tone. Luna didn't answer. She just stared at me. I knew what I had to do, and she knew I would do what was right. I sighed and gripped the edges of the chair. I shouldn't change what is meant to be. But why does it have to be? I don't know. Why does another friend of mine have to perish? Why am I always so very powerless? So weak. I dropped my head into my hooves and rubbed my temples. I could feel a headache brewing. You're not weak, Celestia, said Luna at last. Her voice was worried, yet respectful. I admired her for it. She was as graceful to Twilight for freeing her from Nightmare Moon, although this decision seemed easier for her to make than myself. Then how can I never do what is right, what is needed of me, I asked, still with my eyes closed. Because you care. Be grateful for that. It is something of you I admire. I raised my head and stared at her. What do you mean? I asked. She leaned forward. You... Always seek others, Celestia, she said carefully, picking her words. After 1,000 years, you always go forward to make a friend of a student and of those around you. In the end, their deaths crush you, and you repeat the process. I would have given up long before you. So you're saying I shouldn't make friends? I asked, insulted. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. She took a deep breath to collect her thoughts. After 1,000 years, even though you know the risk when you invest your friendships in them, you do it anyway. And when they end up standing on death's door, you still feel as strongly as this. I admire you for that. You never gave up. I sat back in my chair. Her words floated and wandered in my mind. I would aspire to be like you. Even after that long, you still take it so hard. You care more about any other pony we will ever meet. I look back at her and smile. Thank you, I say. I needed that. As much as it did make me feel better, it gave me more to think about. She nodded graciously and picked up her cocoa. I stood and left quickly. I needed to be alone with my own thoughts. In my own reveres, where my world was that little bit easier and that little bit less corrupt. I went back in my room and laid down on my bed. I routinely removed my crown and switched off the bedside light. As I let myself relax for the first time since finding out about the fate which was yet to come. Let's take a quick drink real quick. Oh God, my fucking throat hurts. <clears throat> All right. Morning came. I raised the sun, much to my disdain. My raising of the sun marked the day she would die. I felt as if I was making her die in some ways. I would raise the sun, and she would die in two hours. I just wish I'd kept my ignorance. I swung my legs over the sides of the bed and levitated my crown to rest on my head. I looked over towards twilight. From amongst the books, her unmade bed still assembled a dip from where she had slept, but she was not in it. I had been woken by her stirring, which was unusual, I found. Maybe she left early. If she had, I would miss the painful goodbye. 
although it would be easier to miss it. I would far prefer it as a final farewell than a departure without an acknowledged receipt. She wouldn't have left, however. My student is kind, grateful, and many other things, but not disrespectful. It would go against every prosperity to leave without a goodbye. I opened the other shutters of my chamber. My orange light poured in and filled me with warmth. My son rose over the roofs of the distant buildings. Those of Gondard seemed forced, too showy for my liking. Had I been given an option, then they would be made to suit the theme of old Canterlot. I am little more than a figure to the city, however. I am a symbol of ordered days. I am fountain of knowledge for some, but knowledge simply without purpose. My thoughts dropped, and a voice rang through the halls. Prince, Princess, said Twilight from behind me. I swallowed my hollow worry with a bitter aftertaste. I turned to face her, and I tried to force a smile. Good morning, Twilight, I said without any satisfaction. She smiled back. Morning, Celestia. I was wondering if we could have breakfast together at the cafe down the road, she said. I'd like that, I said. I followed her downstairs. We entered a waiting cart and drove the short distance down the road. Though the window, I could see that had the cafe was deserted. A cross-eyed owner with a sea blue mane leaned upon the counter. He wiped the countertop with a stained, damped cloth. One eye rested on the doorway, the other down on the counter. Twilight pushed the door open. A small bell jingled the top of the door, causing the owner to raise his head. Good heavens, princess, he said abruptly. He dropped the cloth and made his way around the counter. Any company? Please, please, sit, sit. He pulled out two chairs beside the window. One tea, please, and... Tea also, said Twilight. He nodded and turned. Two teas, at the double, y your highness, he announced to the empty cafe. Twilight stifled a laugh, and I joined her with a weary smile. We sat silently for a moment. Why did you choose to come here? I asked. She shrugged. I came here often as a filly, she said slowly. Her eyes settled out of the window. My father took me here every so often. I nodded. I see. I followed her gaze through the storm clouds gathering on the crest of the furthest houses. Bad weather is looming. She looked at me puzzled. I'm sure the pigs are making it rain for good reasons, she said. I nodded. Yes, I suppose you're right. I jumped slightly as the tray landed with a clatter on the floor beside us. The teapot cracked and spilled its contents upon the floor. Oh dear, oh dear, said the stallion flustered. I I'm sorry, your highness, very quite sorry. He bent down and picked up the pieces. Allow me, I said smiling. I surrounded the teapot in magic and fused the cracked pottery together. The stallion stood shaking. You saved my teapot, he said. He returned a moment later with a new brew in his grasp. It's on the house, your highness, he said with one eye on me, smiling. I smiled back awkwardly. He brought across two cups and an assortment of sugars, sweeteners, and small tubs of milk. Twilight smiled as she turned back to the counter. Princess, said Twilight, leaning up upon the table. I raised my head. Is there something wrong, she asked. I stared blankly at her for a moment. There was so much wrong, so many blind evils which could never see their destructive tendency, and Twilight was still sitting right in the middle of them. Why do you ask? I replied without looking at her. She hesitated for a moment. I'm not sure. She leaned back in the chair with her cup in her hoof. It might just be me. I took a sip of my tea. Well, I'm fine. Trust me. She nodded, but didn't seem convinced. I took another sip of my tea. The driver put her saddlebag in the compartment behind the chariot. He opened the door to allow myself and Twilight to step in. We spoke a little on the ride to the station. We made promises to meet again next month, and despite what I knew, I made the promise regardless. She tried once again to pry my discomfort from me, but I shrugged off her concern. We got out of the carriage. Twilight snuggled her saddle across herself and tightened it. Would you like me to wait, your highness? The driver asked politely. I would like that.
I turned to follow Twilight into the station. It was more crowded than last time. A line selling tickets gathered against the back wall. Twilight's train was already here. She approached it and stood halfway on. She turned back to me. Her smile was so beautiful. Are you sure there's nothing wrong? She asked. How much I wanted to tell her. So many things were yet to be done. She has yet to meet a stallion, to marry here in Canterlot, to bear her own children, who I am loved as my own. But no, all that would never be done. It was written that she would die today. But I couldn't allow it. Let be on my head that things have changed. On my head this will fall. I am the writer. This world is my quill. I will do what I can to make it better. I'm not just a figure, not a statue. I am the immortal ruler of this world, and I will write my world anew. Last call for the Ponyville-bound train. Last call. Celestia, is anything wrong? I stood a step back and thought for a moment. Yes, there is. Twilight, I need you to do something, I said quickly. She took a second before looking shocked. Celestia, the train leaves and... I took a breath. Twilight, there is no time. Ponies might die. She looked puzzled but trusted in me. She nodded. Go to the waiting chariot. Tell him to take you straight back to the palace. No questions. Get back as quick as you can. She nodded. Y yes, Celestia, she said. A tone of fear notable in her voice. She galloped off towards the chariot. The train pulled away just as she left. She was such a good student. Later... I would tell her all of it, of seeing deaths, of how close I came to letting her down. I'd tell her that I know of my place in this world. But for now, lives may be at stake, and I have to protect my people whether they care for me or not. I extend my wings and ran out onto the platform. It must have been a sight to see as I took off to reach the front of the train. I haven't flown in months, and my wings felt stiff and groggy but I still had enough power to reach the front before it got too far away. The train was fast, I should know. I asked for them to be upgraded so they ran quicker, but it was faster. I'm an alicorn. I have the speed of a pegasus. I surged forward through the air with several powerful strokes of my wings. I reached the front of the train and landed with a great thump behind the cabin. I opened the door and a surprise engineer sat with a shovel in one hoof. Stop the train, I commanded. He nodded through a look of panic and quickly pulled the override level behind the engine. The brakes shuddered for a moment and seemed to have no effect for the first seconds. He pushed harder and the brake hit the wheel making a terrible screeching as the train grounded to a halt. He sighed and wiped a hoof across his brow. So, he said with a heavy, heavy breath, what's the problem? I opened my mouth to speak, but no sound came. My mind froze as a foreign thought ran through me. The voice was familiar, but it was so immediate that I couldn't help but be paralyzed by it. Celestia! shouted my sister. Her voice rang in my head. Come quick, sister! Her voice was afraid. I could feel her emotion implanted in me. The engineer looked at me, confused. Princess? I didn't answer. I ran out of the cabin and unfloraled my wings as fast as possible. I flew. I don't know how long I flew, or how far, or how fast. It was all a blur. My terror built in me. Each gust of wind seemed to be pushing me back as I struggled to push through. I felt like I was battling the storm. The bad weather was punishing me for my actions. I threw myself harder toward home. I pushed with all my strength into getting there, into reaching whatever terror I knew awaited me. But then again, I already knew what I was flying toward. I flew above the main street where I spotted Luna. I descended and saw the chaos. I saw the upturned chariot. I saw the gathering crowd. I landed beside my sister. She was crying. Celestia, <laughs> we, we couldn't do anything, she said through tears. No, I said shaking my head. She was hurt, too. We tried, but... I ran past her. I didn't need to hear it. I ran through the crowd and stopped dead. The driver was pressed against a wall. A stallion placed a mask over his face, which fogged up quickly with a fast breath. 
He never broke his stare towards me. One eye was swollen up, and the other looked dead. I looked away to try to see my student, alive and well running from the crowd with only minor scratches and injuries. I glanced back and forth until my eyes landed upon her. I quickly ran towards her. Two guards held me back. I'm sorry, princess. Nothing can be done, one of them said. They both held me back. We can't let you pass, said the other. I frowned and teleported past them. A mare in white stood near my student. I'm sorry, princess. I kneeled down beside her. A long cut ran across her eye down to her jaw. A droplet of blood seeped through from the wound, spoiling her perfect, beautiful face. Her forehoof was crumpled at an impossible angle. I tried to highlight her time left, but nothing showed. The timer was blank. The ghostly letters ticking away, her last seconds didn't show. She was gone. No. <laughs> oh, shit, dude. I'm actually crying from this. <laughs> oh, man. Fuck, that's brutal. I I'm sorry, C Celestia, said Luna. She placed a hoof around me and stared blankly down to the earth, shaking. Rain began to fall into the dust, marking dark crescents. Tears mixed with the rain and ran down my cheek. My breaths quivered. She's gone, I said aloud. She embraced me fully. I'm so sorry. Damn, dude. <laughs> Damn. Oh, I hate tragedies. <laughs> Oh my god. The procession was small. Only friends and family were attending. Luna and I gave a few words, but we weren't to stand out above the rest. This was Twilight's day. It was a day that I had wrote, and despite what Luna has said to console me, I know that it was I that put my friend into that box. They don't know it was me. They don't know what I can see. They may as well know. I might actually prefer it that way. Then they would have something to blame, so that this tragic accident was real to them, so that they didn't feel as helpless. A face to a murderer is kindness. A death by accident is tragic. Instead, I shall live with my burden. I'll let it eat away at me. I'll let my psyche slowly crack and collapse. It should have been me in that box. I can't do anything. I'm powerless. Helpless. Weak. The service finished, and they left. I nodded solemnly to each as they passed. They wore expressions of sadness and acceptance. Some of them even seemed angry, although they would never know what at. Her mother and father were the last to leave. They still stood over the grave. That fresh, loomy soil was still unturned. I stood beside them. Her mother was crying. She looked to me through cloudy eyes. Is there any pony who could have done to stop this? She asked through tears. I just stared. Nothing I could say could put this right. I said gravely. She nodded. Thank you, princess. You meant so much to our twilight. Her husband placed a hoof over her shoulder, and they walked out. I approached the premature grave, which I had put in her. Mm. I approached the premature grave, which I had put her in. I wrote this world into existence. I am the writer of her death. My interference killed her. Let no other fall at my selfishness. I am only a statue, only a figure. I am not a mortal, I am a writer. And this forsaken world is my bloodiest quill.
was a pretty good story. Well, uh, thank you for listening to this reading, everybody. Uh, be sure to like and favorite this for the return of Skullman Reads. And um, be sure to subscribe to help my channel grow and for more fanfics to come. And, uh, yeah. I want to say thank you also to every single one of you who have subscribed to me and for giving me 300 subscribers. 300 subscribers, guys. That's, that's awesome. I literally didn't see me getting 300 subscribers. <laughs> I know it doesn't seem much, but hell, that's a lot to me. It's more people than in my fucking school. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you, every single one of you. Just thank you. Thank you for your support. It really keeps me going and want me to read these fanfics and make these videos for you guys. Um, yeah. Time for me to sign off. Bye, everybody!